the aftermath of the fall. I'm going to be jumping around a lot. Okay, so I may repeat some things. As a matter of fact, I just inserted a couple things uh, at six o'clock here while I was waiting to get on. So um, I was fine tuning it. And um, and I'm actually going to take you into Hagia Sophia. I've got pictures that I took. So we're going to go through some of these things. I'm going to show you some of the stories that have developed. Um, and, and pulling this all together, uh, I, I think I mentioned this last week, I'm, I'm reading several books on it. And um, they're all they, 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 they're all different. You know, I, I have to, you know, they, they all list the, the facts differently. And especially if it's a, you know, if you're looking at something uh, from a Turkish author, you get a whole different picture of the, of the, of the slaughter and everything. Uh, but what what you should try to, to encompass here is just imagine you know you wake up well like like let's say we go to a church service in the morning and then when we finish and we come out the doors uh russia has taken over <laughs> or or you know the chinese have taken over the united states that's what, what this was like there the 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 imperial city there was nothing like uh, constantinople the longest reigning uh empire ever um 1127 years i think and 23 days something like that i have that figure somewhere posted in here um and then just like that in a flash it's gone um all the uh the incredible buildings and everything the walls the the things that protected them um all destroyed because somebody left a door open Somebody was not paying attention to details and left the door open. An arrow hit Constantine, uh, John Longo, Guistianini Longo, the, the, the soldier from uh, Genoa. Uh, you know, if it had gone another inch over, it wouldn't have been such a big deal, maybe. In fact, that, that's one of the facts that if, you, if I look in three different books, I've read that it was an arrow it was a stone fragment from a, a cannon shot. And uh, what was the other thing? It was a third thing that, that hit him. So each one says a different story. But I go mainly by Stephen Runciman, Sir Stephen Runciman. He's a, an Englishman. And he is the, uh, he, he's one of the great authors of all the Byzantine uh, history. So uh, I'm reading one now. Uh, this is really interesting. It's called The Great Church in Captivity by C Stephen Runciman. Uh, when uh, Dino Kokinas was here and he did his presentation, I don't know if you recall if, anybody, if any of you heard it, but he quoted Stephen Runciman. He said his details came from him. He is the acknowledged, really the acknowledged uh, uh, historian on the uh, Byzantine Empire. So when I, when I finish today, if you want to read more on it, this is the book you should get, because this, this is the continuing of the church. This goes up to, the, uh, to 1821, where the, uh, the, you know, the fall, the split, uh, the defeat of uh, the Ottoman Empire, where the Ottoman Empire collapses. Okay, so we'll, we'll just take this one step at a time and, and just review some of the things, because uh, a lot of things developed out of this fall. This was such a catastrophic event. Um, do you know that people actually, the, the priests actually started matin services while, while the, uh, the Ottoman soldiers are marching into the city. They started the church. They didn't, they didn't stop the church service or tell the people to go hide or something. They, they actually continued with their matin services that they were doing. They were doing matin services at the time. Uh, Nobody believed that the city was going to fall. They all believed that it was going to be saved. Um, and I showed you this last week. Uh, this is the exact spot the walls were breached. This is where they came in here. And this is the plaque. I remember reading this. Uh, I came through here. I, I wanted to just walk through the walls like the soldiers did. And uh, I didn't walk in like the soldiers did. I just walked in like I normally would walk. But it was just something, just walking through that. And this is how they came in. And then right behind me, I turned around, I saw the plaque. And it just says, you know, that I met the conqueror, entered these walls in 1453. 
Okay. Now, these walls are right here that we're talking about. You remember when I first told you about the, the this, when we first went over this map, I told you these were the three tiered walls. These were the strong walls, and they're called the Theodosian walls because the emperor Theodosian built them. So that's why they're called the Theodosian walls, to distinguish them from the walls here that were added at the Vlachanera. And you can see it says it there, Vlachanera. And that is where I told you the summer palace was of the uh, emperor. Uh, the, the city itself was here, down here. This is where Hagia Sophia is right here. The Hippodrones here. I'm gonna show you some pictures that I took uh, of these places uh, at the end of the program. But the walls, you can even see it in the sketch here, the walls become you know, ver thinner here. And they're very thin along here, as we told you that they would, as a matter of fact, wherever the water is, the walls are thin because they, um, you know, that you couldn't take ladders and put them up against the walls there. I mean, there was, there was no reason. You had the, the huge moat of the, uh, the waterways, the Sea of Marmara, the Bosphorus, the Golden Horn, surrounded by water. That's why Constantine uh, the Great moved it there, totally secured. And all they had to do, 7,000 soldiers. Remember, that's all that the, the Byzantine Empire had to fight with, 7,000 soldiers. And the soldiers they faced on this side from uh, Mehmet was uh, over 100,000. And they were able to do it for 57 days. They, they, nobody could penetrate because of the, of the structure and the walls. And uh, so what's going to happen over here now is, is Kant, uh, Mehmet is smart enough now to realize this is going to be where the, he entered. This is the actual enter, entry right here, the gate here, the um, Charisian gate or the air, air in uh, the Kerker Porta, it's called. It's got several names, right? I have them listed later. But the walls become thin. This is like an attachment here that was put on so that they could uh, put the palace here, the emperor's palace, and it would lead to the downfall because that's where me, uh, the um, Mehmet concentrated, had his cannons concentrated in that area. And they just kept firing and firing. And Urban's cannon that we talked about, the one that uh, he could only shoot three times a day because it took, uh, uh, like, well, I forget, what did I tell you? Five to six hours to load it? Three hours to load it. No, I think it was more. Yeah, they, so they could shoot it five times a day uh, if they they worked 24 hours. Um, but, that, but now that, well, let me jump ahead here. I don't want to do that. Let's go back here. I'm going the wrong way. We'll get to that in a minute. So the, what's happening now, because of the attacking and everything, the people who lived here gathered down further. They moved down to this area. And um, th there used to be a lighthouse here, okay? And um, so the area is known as the Fanar, P-H-A-N-A-R, the Fanar. And if that's familiar to you, that's because that's where our patriarchate is. And that's why it's there, because the, the, they moved down. When Mehmet conquered, um, what, several he, he issued several uh, provisions of organization. We're going to go over those shortly. And one of the uh, organizations was that people had to live in areas, the, especially the Greeks. They didn't want to see them going all over the city because they, they were afraid. Mehmet is afraid now from this point on that uh, the Greeks are going to get together and overcome and come and attack Constantinople and take it back. So he becomes paranoid over that fact. So he, he doesn't let anybody go out. You, you got to stay by your house. You gotta, you're got you not allowed to go and visit your combado or something, you get, unless he was your next door neighbor. So this area became the Greek area. All right. And that's why the patriarchate is there to this day. Okay. And that's why the patriarchate is not in um, Hagia Sophia. Would you not think the Hagia Sophia? And it was originally. But that's why it's now in the Church of St. George, and you'll see pictures of it. I, I surmise that most of you have not seen the, the Patriarchate, the inside or pictures of it. And um, I'm going to show you some of those that I took. They're not the best pictures, but they're pictures, and you can see. So the Greeks are going to move down here, and this is where they're going to grow. And, and, and uh, I'm going to go into some detail on that shortly. All right, this is just a, a, an artist's drawing of uh, Constantine. Paleologos on his white horse, looking at the, at the uh, Mehmet soldiers. Look at all of them. 
Look, look at them all. 100,000 of them. You know, 7,000 soldiers looking out at 100,000 that they have to fight. I, I just can't, I can't fathom it. I can't imagine doing what they did, what they had to do. And they did it right up to the end. Here's another good picture of showing all the troops. There's the cannon. Look at the size of that thing. That's the small one. That's not the 27 foot one. And this is Mehmet, the conqueror. Um, and he's now, they, they've won now This at this point, they're gonna be entering uh, Constantinople. And here's the enter, Mehmet enters Constantinople. And uh, you can see the dead soldiers in the front. He, he's coming in triumphantly. And these are the Janissaries that led the way. You remember the Janissaries? And this is a symbolic person here in black. He's got a turban on, so he's Turkish. Um, I, I, I forgot what I read on it. <laughs> Forgive me. Uh, I'll, I'll check it out and email it to you. But there's, uh, he symbolizes a strength. I think uh, the, the, the um, old wave and the new wave now, the new wave is going to be the, the, the uh, Ottoman Empire. And here are the three names I could find, the Carician Gate, the... Uh, Adrianople Gate and the Erdenekapi. It's also called the Gerga Porta. Gerga Porta. Porta is, you know, Greek word for door, and the Gerga, I don't know what that meant. But <clears throat> here he is entering, and um, the, the artist here has given him uh, an expression of uh, bewilderment almost. Uh, because he didn't expect to see what he saw. Uh, like I told you, the, uh, the Islamic code states that if you, uh, in battle, you first go to your enemy and you offer them three chances, three times you must do this. You offer them the right to give up and not fight and skip the battle if they, you know, just give up. And if they do that, if they agree to that, then uh, they will not be uh, punished at all. They will be permitted to live as they did before, but the, the, the Ottoman Empire would take over the city. That was their code. And three times, Constantine Paleologos told them no. And uh, so now, because of that, the code says that they're entitled to three days of pillage. And, um, you know, and they couldn't wait to do that. Uh, you know, like I say, even for them, it was a surprise that they won. And here's where you start to see different, uh, tremendous differences in the um, explanations of what happened. Um, the book that I've read from um, Crowley that I recommended. What's that doing? Oh, my gosh. This thing jumps around very easily. I'm the wrong way now. I'm sorry. I hit the book when I picked this one up. All the way back to the beginning. Ooh. Here we are. Sorry. Okay, there we go. This book that I read by Roger Crowley. Um, gives a, a pretty fair view of it. Uh, Runciman is more clear on it, uh, but some of the things I got on Wikipedia, um, I, I, uh, I'm not that sure of the, the, the facts. I think it was uh, slotted toward the Ottoman Empire. Um, it's pretty clear that uh, when the soldiers were given their permission to go into the city for three days, that they really did a number on it. I mean, they really destroyed everything. They ripped things apart. They took our icons and, and just ripped them out so they could get the jewels that were around the frames of the icons. Uh, they um, desecrated bodies because they heard that, I'm gonna show you that when I show you the pictures because they, they felt that there was uh, jewelry hidden, old and everything in, in the uh, crypts. Um, and they actually, uh, you know, captured everybody. They, they killed, on the first day, they killed anybody they saw because they, they wanted to eliminate the Greeks entirely so that uh, they couldn't come back and reconquer it. Um, but the, uh, there is indication 
even by by Crowley, Roger Crowley, that uh, Mehmet, you know, tried to organize the city, and he wanted to, or he, you know, he wanted to conquer it. He wanted the city to continue because it was the most prosperous city in the world. Uh, you know, the, the the last for as long as it did, and uh, it was the 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 pinnacle of cities, the diamond of, of all the cities in the world. It was that's why they he wanted it so badly. So he he didn't want to destroy it, everything inside, and he. Uh, actually felt kind of badly, uh, some of the writings that I read, um, when he went in there and conquered it all and saw the devastation that he, and one, one uh, thing that I read said he actually, when he went to Hagia Sophia Church, he started crying uh, when he saw all the death in there. And that's another fact, that the, the, how many people were killed. Um, it, 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 there's nothing consistent about it. They say that uh, Hagia Sophia could hold 26,000 people. I learned this when I was in Hagia Sophia in the tour, could hold, house 26,000 people. And all the Greeks, the, the, the wives, you know, and the children all went to Hagia Sophia, the old men and the old women. And that's where they went and they locked the doors so they could do their matin service. Um, well, the Janissaries, when they broke in, I mean, they, they were ruthless. They, they just killed everybody. And the figures on the number of people that were killed vary. Um, if you got 26,000 people in Hagia Sophia, I don't know if all, you know, if there, no one went around, I don't think he counted them. But um, the, the figures that I've read in several books show that 4,000 were killed, civilians were killed. Um, and as many as maybe 40,000. So it, it was, you know, it was not the place to wake up to on that uh, on May 29th, 1453, and the next morning. It's a tragic place to be. Uh, yeah, that's what that last picture I just showed you. So he's going to go, so he goes in and he stops the pillage. He says, okay, enough. You've gotten everything you wanted. You've, got, you've all got your jewels and everything. And uh, the Islamic law also says on the, at the end of the pillage, they're supposed to show everything they they collected from everybody and that the the, the emperor, the conqueror, Mehmet, would get one fifth of it. So he became a very wealthy man overnight. All right, again, these, these are just pictures. Oh, Showing the, um, the part that uh, they entered from. This is that, remember the map, it showed that area going out. This is that area. This is the palace, that uh, for the summer palace for the uh, emperor. So this is where they're going to enter, and here, through here, and there's a gate here. You can see it. See the road here? It goes up right up to the gate. That's the that's where the pictures I was showing. You. That's where they entered. This is what it looks like today, it's because this is, took the heaviest bombing. You could see it really took a did a number on the walls there. Even the even these uh, simpler walls. And that's the other side. I've shown you this picture before. This is the other side of those walls, and this is where the uh, palace was of uh, Constantine. Um, I think I, I showed, did I show you this picture before? This is where, um, this is at the Blacanera area that we're talking about now. This is that area. And this is the church that was built over the original site of the church where the first time Dinet Barmachon was chanted. Um, I always get chills when I walk in here because what always happens is as soon as everybody goes in, we all start singing Dinet Barmachon. And it's just such a moving thing um, to think that this is where they, they, and that was because of the victory of the sixth century. You're going to, you know, 800 years earlier. Uh, Okay, now the, the, we're back to the walls. There's Aya, this is uh, not Aya Sophia. This is the Blue Mosque. Uh, the, we're gonna go over that in a minute too, okay. All right, it's just some pictures, just show you the gravity of the wall, of the battle. Uh, what it must've been like back then, boy, to witness this. And you, you can walk, if you go to Constantinople, you can walk these walls, they're still there. They're there, and you just walk. Take a walk down there. Uh, Bishop Gregory and I did it when we were there. Of course, it was George Tatsis at that point. 
but we uh, we spent a whole day walking around the city taking pictures. Here's the gate again. I already showed you that. Okay. Uh, anybody recognize this up here? Does that look familiar to anybody? Should look familiar to all of you if you're you St. Nectarius people. This is the original, this is the Zodoro Pihi, the fountain that we have outside in our courtyard there. All right, this is the original. This is the Zodoro Pihi. And it's um, it's in that same area where the Dina Parma, well, no, it's outside. It's outside of uh, Constantinople. It's a little bit further outside. Just happened to have a picture. I, I wanted to show you this picture down here. These are the tombs of the patriarchs. And once the, um, as things would develop and continue, the, the Turks would go in there and overthrow the coffins. They'd open them up the uh, tombs and just dump out the bodies. Um, so they, they've, they've gathered it together now. And this is where they all are, bur are buried. Athena Goris is here and all the uh, past patriarchs, Demetrius. Um, okay. How did that get all the way up there? I don't want to go over that. Well, I might as well since uh, it's here. There is a place in Sparta, and this is another place that if those of you who are going to Greece, if you're going down to Sparta, you can go to this place. It's called Mistra. And Mistra is where the Paleologi family was. You see the name up here, Paleologi. That is the name of our, the last uh, emperor, Constantine, Constantine Paleologi. This is where he was from. And Mistra has a complete replica replica of Constantinople. It's got the walls, and I think I have a picture here. Yeah, this is an old picture. But see, it's got the walls, it's up on a hill, and it's got, the, it even has a church called Hagia Sophia. And in Hagia Sophia, you go in there, and on the floor they have, um, there it is, the seal of the Byzantine emperor. Now, I got to give credit to the metropolis of Mistra. Uh, they're the ones that uh, own this picture just for uh, copyright. Uh, so I'm not infringing here. And um, this is where Constantine Paleolo was stood when they made him emperor. He's the only emperor of the Byzantine Empire that wasn't uh, uh, coronated in um, Constantinople, in Hagia Sophia. He was, he, he was here in Mistra. And uh, Mista became like a, a, a second Constantinople. It had, uh, at times it had ruling powers and uh, it governed. And, and here the emperor, the last uh, emperor from the family of the Paleologi would uh, take over. Um, Constantine would be the last one. But I, I just remember standing there and um, when I went and the bus was getting loaded with all the people and they were all looking for me. And uh, when if, I didn't want to leave that spot. I just couldn't believe it. I was standing right where the spot where... Uh, Constantine uh, Paleologo was. Okay, now the, historically there's this guy named uh, who uh, was uh, at the time a, a, a real strong servant of uh, Constantine, the emperor. His name was George Franzes. And uh, he wrote this on June 1st. I'm going to read it to you. On the third day after the fall of our city, the Sultan celebrated his victory with a great joyful triumph. He issued a proclamation the citizens of all ages who had managed to escape detection were to leave their hiding places throughout the city and come out into the open as they were remain free and no question would be asked. He further declared the restoration of houses and property to those who had abandoned our city before the siege. If they returned home, they would be treated according to their rank and religion as if nothing had changed. That's what Mehmet offered, okay? This was written June 1st, 1453. But we know the children, if they were male, were sent off to become janissaries. <laughs> the Turks, come, you know, or had them uh, imprisoned and uh, took them away from their families and made them uh, uh, trainees to become janissaries, the soldiers. Um, the women were used as, uh, as you think women would be used at that time um, um, for, for sexual pleasure. And old people were decapitated. They didn't want any, any parts with old people. They, there was no use for them. Uh, they wanted to build the city up, so they, they, uh, they kept some, a lot of the men, and they did uh, tolerate and free um, 
there were a lot of citizens that they granted the peace to. But they, they if you read this, and this, again, this is from uh, Constantine's uh, the number one guy. Um, he survived the, uh, the battle, obviously. And uh, he made it back home. But uh, <clears throat> you, so, uh, Tess, you asked about Constantine. What happened to him and uh, the other guy? Justini Longo. Here's Constantine. Uh, the, the reports were that <clears throat> when he when he saw the uh, the soldiers breaking through the Charisian gate there, that's what they're doing there. And then he took off his helmet so that everybody would recognize him, and he grabbed his sword. And there he is here, and he charged the soldier. Can you believe that? He charged. They were trying to beg him to go away. His, his soldiers, his helpers, his uh, organizers <clears throat> wanted him to, to leave and get on a ship somewhere because a lot of them were able to leave. They were able to go to the Golden Horn there, get on a boat and get out of town. Uh, that's what happened to, to Guistiani Longo, the, uh, the soldier that was so prominent in the battle. But Longo was going to die with his people, he said. So he took his hat off so they recognized him, took his sword, and he went into, he charged these guys with his sword. Uh, amazing, but you can see he's already surrounded by by the Ottoman soldiers, and this guy's getting ready to cut his head off, and that's what happened. His head was cut off, so they were never able really to identify his body, and this really upset Mehmet because the one thing he wanted was the emperor's body, dead or alive, to prove that Mehmet was now the the new emperor, and um, the Janissaries, uh, a couple of them. Uh, believed that they had captured uh, Mehmet or uh, Constantine here at this, uh, as this painting shows here. And they took um, the body to uh, Mehmet and his head that they had cut off. And uh, Mehmet put it on a stake and posted it outside his tent so that everybody could see it and uh, that he was the new conqueror now. Uh, but then again, um, there are stories and there are a lot of myths that are going to develop now. One of them is that God sent angels down to take uh, the body of uh, Constantine and put it uh, under the, the gates, the wall, uh, until the proper time for him to come back and take control and lead another assault against and take back Constantinople. And there are many Greeks that believe this. And it almost happened in 1945 in the war. The, um, the Greek soldiers, you know, were, were, were getting strong. And then they, were, they actually were marching up towards Constantinople. And it was the British government that stopped them. Um, because they, didn't, they, they were trying to bring peace in the area. And they didn't want another confrontation of a big battle between uh, uh, another situation like this one. So they stopped the... the, the uh, the soldiers, they made them go back to Greece. Well, they were in Greece. They were going up through uh, Thessalonica and going up through that area. So it almost happened that, um, that, that we, there was an attempt made to try and get back Constantinople. But that was the last big chance that they had. And they had a chance to do it then. That was the irony. They, would, they had the soldiers. Turkey wasn't that strong at that time as, as it is today. And they could have done it then, but uh, it wasn't to be. So there also is a third story that uh, they found a body that underneath a pile. I think I told you this last week. It was a pile of bodies here at this point. And when they uh, unraveled all the bodies, the last one had the shoes that the Byzantine emperor would wear. It had the wings of the Byzantine emperor on them. And uh, they believed that the soldiers that were dying, they're all going to die. Um, covered Constantine's body so that the, the, the Ottoman soldiers couldn't take him. They couldn't desecrate his body. That's the one I like to believe, that one and, and the, the angels. I think that's the one I prefer to believe. So you could take your choice of three. If you're telling your uh, Gumbadi the story tomorrow or at the breakfast table, if you want to pass it on to your grandchildren or whatever, you could pick one of the three or tell all three. But he was a, I told you from the beginning, he was a great leader. And he was a great leader. 
He just was not a good stat uh, strategist. And that was the uh, reason to get the Constantine Longo, uh, not Constantine, John Longo, Guistianini Longo. And he was wounded, as you all know, we talked about that. That's what opened up the floodgates. And that was the big turning point of the war. Had he not uh, taken that arrow, whatever, uh, uh, Mehmet was ready to pull his soldiers out. He already was telling the janissaries to come back. He was already given up. And then he saw the panic on the walls that everybody was panicking because Longo was wounded and they were, this, his fellow soldiers were taking him off the walls, taking him down to a ship. That ship would go back to Genoa and he would die uh, in a few days afterwards uh, from the wound. Uh, so everybody's dying here. Okay, let's go on. What's this picture here? All right, I'm gonna, these are some things that happened, okay, as a result of it. Now, <clears throat> let me explain that one. The clergy was made to wear black garments. Traditionally, Okay, and I got this direct from Father Calivas uh, from the seminary. He was the dean of the, the seminary. I was speaking with him today about this, and he wrote a book on it. And I also got it from Father Stelius uh, because he was a student of Father Calivas. Uh, the uh, the monks, the mon the monastics, always wore black. Okay, in the, and from the very beginning, they wore black. And the reason they wore black is because they didn't want to, uh, you know you know, get into a fashion thing with colors and everything, bright colors. They wanted to be, stay black. So when Mehmet conquered everything, I told you he's going to reorganize everything now. And one of the ways he wanted, he wanted to, you know, he had this, uh, he was scared to death. He was, you know, panic stricken that he was going to lose it to a, another group of soldiers coming. So he identified everybody. He made everybody wear colors. Uh, women could not wear bright, fancy colors in their outfits. They had to wear dull clothing. They couldn't wear you know, new fashion clothing. Uh, I don't know what fashions they had in Constantinople back then in 1453, but <clears throat> they couldn't wear them. <laughs> you know, they had to wear plain, simple clothing. And um, <clears throat> this emphasized uh, the, the church, the priests had to wear, be consistent in their clothing. So the, the church started, the men started wearing, the priests started wearing black in their daily clothing to identify, so that they're identified as priests. So it's, uh, that is one of the, the things that developed. Uh, May 29th is known as Black Tuesday. And, and it's considered by some to be an unlucky day of the week. Um, if Black uh, Tuesday falls on a Sunday, Nobody get or Saturday. Nobody gets married on that day in Greece, and I don't know if they still uh, have that uh, as a strict rule. Not a rule, but a you know habit. I don't know. All right, now the habit of communion three times a year. When I was growing up, I, even when I first moved to Charlotte, uh, I go to church, and I, I can remember a couple times that Father Constantine, Father C, came out with communion. There was no one there to take it. And he just turned around and walked back in. I, I mean, I, I've seen that happen. Um, now, you know, you can see the lines of people taking communion. My family taught me to take communion three times a year. Easter, Christmas, and uh, Panagias. And that was it. And I'm not saying that, the, that this was imposed by Mehmet. Okay. Um, I would have said it uh, a week ago, but as I researched it, I got a better answer. Um, there was an obvious fall off of the attendant, uh, attention to communion uh, as the church started to grow. It, the church was built, uh, the services were built, or, organized so that everybody took communion every week. Remember, the services were in homes in those days. So everybody went to the home, they all took communion. So they, they, that's why they fasted Wednesday and Friday. That's how the church was organized. And through time, through habit, people got lax. And with this now, with Mehmet telling everybody, you can't go out and travel, you can't go out and visit, uh, you gotta stay in restricted areas. Uh, it was difficult getting to a church. So um, 
the, the, the habit of uh, communion three times a year became almost a rule with them. That, the, you know, they only tried to go out to the churches three times a year to take communion. Uh, the, the churches were burnt down. Um, you know, the first people that, uh, that they tried to uh, control in um, the church were the bishops. They killed many bishops. And people were getting communion three times a year. And so this became a fixation. All right. So it wasn't an order from a med. I don't want to because I would have said that about a week ago, and I think I might have said it at one time in our classes. Uh, it wasn't an order by Mehmet. It was just a, a development of the practice of not being able to get out as easily. It's like this COVID thing, <laughs> right? You had, they had to stay in their houses. They couldn't get out. All right, so there's two things that have developed uh, through the battle here. All right, scholars consider the fall of Constantinople as the end of the Middle Ages and the beginning of the Renaissance. There's going to be a great transformation now from here on. And I'm going to cover that in more detail a little later. I got a little more of an explanation on it. But what it is is that uh, new things are going to develop from here. A lot of it's starting with uh, the technology of the, of the Battle of Constantinople because of the uh, cannons. Uh, it's a whole different technology. The, 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 that they were used there to uh, defeat uh, the you know the walls and everything, and you're going to get something called the Gutenberg press now, and what that's going to do is take all these things that I'm telling you about and sending them out all over the world. So everybody was reading about the downfall because nobody was believing it that it could happen, and everybody now you know is reading. There were so many things written on it, and so many stories that developed, and this. I still have one more to tell you about that we'll be getting to in a minute here. But uh, um, that was the main thing that happened afterwards that, that really you know, spread the story out about this and, and gave a lasting impression and gave different uh, impressions. And that's the history that we have to go by now, okay? That, that's the recorded history. Nobody was walking around like newspaper people, reporters taking notes. Um, it's too dangerous. Uh, people were running. After the fall, the Greeks would congregate around the area known as the Phanar. I've already covered that with you all. And after the fall, the Pope called for an immediate counterattack, but could not get enough support to accomplish this. So our brothers in the West, you know, wouldn't come to help us. Uh, uh, they, they did, the Pope did send ships with supplies and food, and they did get through for, uh, the battle, and um, that prolonged the battle. But uh, they didn't send soldiers to help or whatever, and uh, it was just complete devastation. Okay, I told you John Guastianini died of his wounds on June 1st, 1453. There's John there. Constantine's body, we right, 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 never liked this. It was his, hid his body beneath the Golden Gate. The Golden Gate was in, if you could picture that picture, the uh, map I showed you, the Golden Gate would be at the bottom left, okay? Um, that's where the buses come. When you come into Constantinople from the airport, the buses, that's the first thing you hit, the Golden Gate. And that's the gate where the emperor always came in. The, uh, the, the emperor always entered Constantinople through the Golden Gate. So Constantine Paleologos, when he first came, came through the Golden Gate. So that's where the, the myth says that he's buried, that the angels put him so that he could enter from there. Uh, but um, historians believe that there was a final blow to the Byzantine Empire. It was at the time that the Ottoman soldiers entered Hagia Sophia, which is one of the first places the soldiers went to. Services had just begun, matin services, and the doors were locked. The soldiers chopped down the massive doors, entered the church, dealing the emphatic blow to the Byzantine Empire. Two legends have come from this final moment. <clears throat> okay, and I think I covered the one. Um, where is it? Um, following the, oh no, I didn't tell you about this. Um, the night before the attack, there was a service that the, the uh, patriarch wanted to have a service, okay? Like we would normally do, you know, any big event. So at the service, Constantine was going to take communion. And before he did, he went around to all his soldiers and anybody who was there at the church service and asked for forgiveness for any mistakes that he had made, for any offense that he made to anybody. He went around and did this to everybody. Um, he was an amazing person. And uh, I'm surprised he's not a saint. I um, guess he didn't do any miracles, but uh, he was just an amazing person. 
And uh, following communion, and I've read this in every book that I've studied, um, the priest, the celebrants of the pe pre, the celebrants of the service, gave the communion and then turned around and disappeared in the walls of uh, Hagia Sophia and saying, and the, the, the myth is that they will come back when Constantinople re, re, you know, resurrects and becomes Constantinople again. Um, and the people believe this. The people, you know, so there are a lot of people waiting for this to happen. Um, they believe it, it'll happen. And the other myth, um, here's where I'm gonna show you this picture. And I'm gonna show you some pictures later that, that are a little bit stronger. You see, this is inside Hagia Sophia Church. I guess you all can see that, right? And uh, these columns here, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the, all of the uh, seven wonders of the world. One of them was the Temple of Artemis, which is in uh, Ephesus, which is Turkey. And um, these columns are from the temple that was built for uh, Artemis in Ephesus. They're, they're uh, made of jade. They're, they're amazing. And the reason we're gonna discuss this in a second, it brings up the second myth. And uh, this, is, this is, just doesn't make sense, especially now that I understand how many people died, the, the figures don't match. But <clears throat> th there is in one of these columns, it's on the other side, and I couldn't find a picture. I took a picture of it and I couldn't find it. Um, about right at this point, where, where the pointer is here, the cursor is, there is a hoof print of a horse way up here, okay? And look, you can see people here. This, you know, a person is about this high. It's way up here. Now, how did a horse get up a column? The, the myth is that when this, the Janissaries came to attack the people and they started to kill them all in the service, at the matin service I was telling you about, um, which it, which I was leading to in the previous paragraph there, that that, that was probably the final blow of the Byzantine Empire. It's the last thing that happened that sunk the Byzantine Empire. That the soldiers, when the Janissaries got in there, after they had killed everybody with their horses and everything, the horses walking on top of the bodies. And one of the horses kicked the, the, uh, the column there and left this imprint. And when we do the tours, they point that out. You know, I just, I just can't picture that. I just can't picture the horses walking on the bodies. I can't picture that many dead people because remember, I told you, the the uh, the, the estimates are four thousand dead. Well, there would have been a lot more if they were walking on top of bodies here. And uh, so I, I don't know. You, you know, that's, I'm just telling you the stories and this that people believe that happened there. Okay, met, immediately set in motion and organized in the Greek population. We discussed that. No gatherings were permitted. This would lead to the limitation of communion. Three times a year, they were forced to live in their own neighborhoods without traveling around. No bright festive outfits were permitted to be worn. Street dress for clergy was restricted. Black, we covered all this. This also came from the monastic wardrobe requirements. All right, and there's the, uh, the slaughter was 40,000, 4,000 to 40,000. Oh, okay. What the... Uh, the 40,000 was the people, they blinded 40,000 of the civilians following uh, in the three day pillage that they did. And that uh, anybody six years, oh, I covered that. And old, older were killed, okay. All right, now, He did organize, Mehmet, um, an, an attack on Venice in 1463, which lasted 15 years. He would continue on to Rome, killing 12,000 citizens. It was at this time that Mehmet died, all right? And um, it stopped the, the Italian campaign. Um, he had a fixation, Mehmet, with uh, Rome and with the Venice, the Venetians, and he hated them. He hated them. He didn't hate the Greeks. He hated the Venetians. And um, you, I'm gonna show you a picture here shortly. Do you remember that I told you the leader of the Venetians was a guy named Dondolfo when the, 12th, when the Fourth Crusade came in and he was buried in Hagia Sophia? He had his crypt desecrated because the rumor was that he was buried with jewels and everything. 
So, and he hated uh, uh, Don Dolfo. So he had the, the crypt removed. And he took the bones of Don Dolfo and he threw them in the streets so the dogs would eat them. Um, that's, a, that's how fixated he was on uh, all these things. Uh, he had just conquered the greatest city in the world and he's worried about Venice. He wants to conquer that, but he dies before he can get to that. And that stopped the uh, Ottoman uh, advancement. All right. Uh, the Battle of Constantinople heralded the advancement of warfare technology with the massive cannons and the impact of gunpowder. Gutenberg press spread the whole. So it's all the battle of Greek population started. We've gone over all this. Here's the walls I was telling you about, the, the columns. Okay. All right. I'm going to stop this. Uh, there's the action. This is Hagia Sophia now inside. I'm going to go show you. We're going to stop this presentation. I'm going to show you another set of pictures that I have of the inside of Hagia Sophia. I want to go over with you. This is the tomb of a Gondolfo right here. There's his crypt. There's the, that's this thing here, right there. Okay. And uh, they, they just dug this all up and threw his bones outside. Okay, we can go, uh, let me go into some pictures here now. I've got a few more minutes here. I want to show you these. Take you inside Hagia Sophia so you can see some of these things. All right, don't go away. This will take a second. Um, there it is. Okay. All right, I'm just going to take you a tour around here. I'm, I'm in a bus driving around the city. So some of these, there's a, uh, the Blue Moss back here and the, the minarets. If you go to Constantinople, the, the Blue Mosque has six minarets. The minarets were put up uh, at Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia has four. The minarets are where the uh, the, the bashkas, the uh, you know the, the, the priests of the uh, Islam, we, we get up on their towers here at the top of the tower, and they would sing out the prayers every morning and every evening. And uh, some of them, uh, I've been to Indonesia and the Philippines. If you get a hotel next to one of them, they wake you up at four in the morning with their, with their, with their chanting. It's, uh... Okay, why can't that change? Let's go, come on. It's supposed to change. All right, that's that. Uh, uh, the, the church with the Tinepe Marco on the song. This is the bridge. Remember, I told you the two sides are two different continents. One is uh, this side is Asia and this side is Europe. Okay, if you look here, um, here's Hagia Sophia down here. And over here is the Blue Mosque. And this is a park in between. And it looks like the Blue Mosque is bigger than Hagia Sophia. It's not. The, the dome of Hagia Sophia was... Um, Hundred and eight feet long, the dome. The church itself of Hagia Sophia was two hundred and ninety feet long. Sorry, two hundred and seventy feet long. That's ninety yards. Now, to give you a perspective, this is Hagia Sophia we're talking about. To give you a perspective, a football field's a hundred yards. So you could basically put a football field inside of Hagia Sophia. That's how big Hagia Sophia was. And remember now, it's built in the fifth century, okay? Um, it's just amazing when you think of it. But what the, um, what the Ottomans tried to do, they stopped the building of any churches with domes. And they reserved that strictly for their mosques. And that's why all the mosques have domes, right? And all the old Greek churches have domes, and now, now you know why. Greek church, it was the Greek church, you know, that first did the domes, and there were a reason for the domes. And um, now Mehmet is going to make sure that uh, the dome is recognized as an Islamic place. And that's what you have here, you can see it. But what they would do, because they couldn't, they couldn't figure out how to build the dome. The first couple that uh, were put on Hagia Sophia collapsed. It was very difficult to do. They didn't have instant glue, you know, so they had, it's kind of difficult to build those things. 
So what they would do, they never mastered the technique of doing it. Instead, they would build the, the mosques on the hills so that they would look higher and bigger than the uh, Greek churches that were there. And that's what this is here. You see, he's up on a hill here. And it looks like it's a bigger church than the Hagia Sophia. It's not. They, they could never match um, the building uh, concept of uh, parishes. Why is this? Uh, I want to get down to. Um, okay. If you get to the Patriarchate, in the Patriarchate, they actually have the relics of St. John Chrysostom. That's the relics back here. And it's almost a complete body. And here is St. Gregory the Theologian. These were given back to us by uh, John Paul. The, the second, is it? Yeah, John Paul the second. Um, gave it back. The Crusaders of the 1204 took the relics from Constantinople when they destroyed it and sent it back to uh, Venice. And uh, like I said, John Paul gave it back to the, the Orthodox Church and it's in our Patriarchate. Um, why is this not changing? When I did it, when I practiced it, it was working beautifully. Okay, I want to go to something. Let me, I have to look at them. Here, there's the Patriarchate. All right, that's the entryway to the Patriarchate. It's, a, it's a, almost like a Lutheran uh, church, right? It doesn't no dome or anything because they weren't allowed to build domes. And uh, it's it's kind of small when you think the significance of it. It's the head. It's like it's like the the, the uh, Saint Peter's Cathedral. It's equal to that to the Vatican. Okay, and inside it's very small. but it has the biggest heart, okay? When you approach, we, to, to get to that court that we were just at, um, you gotta go up these steps and you come to this gate here. And this is the original entryway. And um, a few years after the fall of Constantinople, uh, 20 or 30 years afterwards, um, the po our patriarch was hung here and uh because he's he um supported uh, uh some of the events that got the, the the ottoman empire upset about so they hung him there and uh, to this day those doors have not been opened and it's a bone of contention with the uh, the, the turkish government right now they're insisting that they open the doors and they won't do that. They built an entryway to the side here. This is, an, this is another door here. This man is going to go in this way. He can't get through those doors. Our church, uh, Patriarchate, will not open those doors out of respect to Gregory V, who was hung there. So uh, I think I can move this now. Yeah, there we go. This is the outside walls to um, the Patriarchate. All right, this is just some of the, um, this is in Hagia Sophia. I just, just showing you some of the, you might recognize some of these icons. And this is where they originated from. But I want to get to, um, all right, this part, I think I got a better picture here of this. You know what this is? That's the Northex. That's the Northex to the, um, or the Bangari area, to, to Hagia Sophia. It's the size of a church. And, you know, um, our design is perfect because there's two of them. There's first, the first entryway is a smaller one, a little smaller than this, not much smaller. And then you got this huge narthex there. Huge. Like I say, that could be a church. That's how big this, this church was. And that's the uh, back of it. Um, this is in Constantinople. This is the underground. Justinian built an underground waterworks. This is their water supply. This is how they had uh, running water and everything for their toilets and everything. It's an amazing place, uh, Constantinople. They were so advanced in their technology. And you can go down there. They have tours down there. It's uh, very interesting. Oh, that's a bad picture. All right. This is where, you remember the Hippodrome when I showed you the picture of the map? I said the Hippodrome, we're going to talk about it later. And there was a column there. And I'm going to show you that column again. This is the actual column. 
this is from Egypt. Um, there's another one on the other side of this, and that's the original one from, from Egypt. I mean, how many years ago was that now? And it's still there. And uh, this, this marked the column. There was one on each end of the Hippodrome. The Hippodrome is not there anymore. Um, this is the place of a lot of bombings, terrorist bombing and everything. I like to bomb this area because people congregate here. Hagia Sophia is right over here, the next street. Uh, so I want to get to the inside. You probably have seen this, this picture. Okay. Um, this is a Justinian given uh, about a year, the, the church, dedicating the church. Because uh, uh, about a year was dedicated as the uh, patron saint of uh, Constantinople. So he's dedicating Hagia Sophia to her there. And I forget who this is. It's a wife of somebody. Um, let me move on here. Here, that's what I want to show you. Doesn't that look like St. Ectarius? <laughs> if you look up, except the, it would have a, the, the icon here, the, the Christ is gone. Instead, they got this plate that the Turks put over it, uh, with Islamic stuff. But <clears throat> the original design of the dome, this is standing underneath the dome. All right, from here to here, remember it's 180 feet wide. And do you see how, how the, the uh, shine is? The, the light in the morning and in the evening would come through the windows like this and, and just reflect and, and it would be very bright. And it would look like it's a crown floating on top of the cathedral. That was the design of it, to make it look like a crown on top of the church. and that's. You know, we have exactly the same thing as St. Ignatius. We have the windows. And, and lots of times in the services, especially the evening services, I can't see at the, the uh, chanting stand because the light coming through is so bright. Um, we have to, I have to hide behind the, uh, the choir stand. Of course, you can't see me anyhow behind a choir stand, you know, it's not that tall. But that's why it was designed. And, and also the design of Hagia Sophia made it a microphone. All right? So the, the, the sound just travels through here. It reverberates through it. And, and it's just redirected throughout the whole place. It's just an amazing concept. I've got a picture here I want to show you. Let's put a year again. Let's, here's Dundolfo. There it is. Dundolfo. Let me... Okay. That was our tour guide there. There's the uh, column. This is the one that had the, the hoof print. It's a little further up. You can't see it. It's way above the people. But as far as the priests, remember I told you there's a, there's a thought that the myth that the priests after the communion disappeared on the walls. Well, there, that, that could have happened. Um, uh, one of the emperors, I think it was Theodosian, had built a passage from the palace to the back wall there, come into the, in, into the uh, Eero, into the altar, okay, from the back. It was a hidden door, and uh, the thought is that they went into this hidden door and went out. There was, there was a passage there. So, you know, some of these myths have a, a basis to them. You may recognize some of these people. This is the altar, or was the altar. Um, this is where the altar was. This is where the patriarch you know, did the um, services and everything. It now has Muslim uh, finishings. Um, there's the Platidera, uh, uh, like we have our Panagia, we're holding Christ, and there it is there. And it's still there. Okay. This is the spot that the... Um, emperors would stand like the one I showed you in the Mistra for uh, Constantine Paleologos. This is where all the other emperors were, uh, you know, confirmed as, uh, as emperors at this spot here. This is the, what would have been the Corostasio, which is, you know, now a Muslim uh, edifice. And I want to get one picture here. That's, um, yeah, there's another shot of the walls. There's the, if you've seen that. Yeah, that's the one I wanted to show you. The first thing that Mehmet did in the, in the subsequent leadership of the Ottoman Empire and, and the Turkish government is to take things like this and cover up the icons. Okay. Fortunately, actually, fortunately, they did because they preserved the icons by doing that. And um, 
but I don't know. Right now, you know, it was a big thing that uh, er Erdogan, uh, press, premier of, uh, of Turkey, uh, converted it. Uh, it's a museum at this point. When I'm in there taking pictures, it's a museum. It was made a mosque, then a museum. It's now um, a mosque again. As, uh, just this year it was made a mosque. So these things are all back up covering all the, uh, and they're starting to remove the icons now. That's what's sad. We're losing all those magnificent icons that were in there. Okay. There's a, another side of the uh, North, Northex. Um, all right, let me get back to the, uh, we're almost done here. Matter of fact, I got to end. I've gone over a little bit, but I got to show you the ending. Here's the here's the finale. So don't go away. Spend a lot of time on the finale here. Okay. So let me get back to this now. Let's get here near the end. Okay. All right, the Byzantine Empire lasted 1,123 years and 27 days. It would be named originally, Mehmet named it Is Islambol, okay, meaning full of Islam. That's what it literally means. And it was and it was the name of the city. Actually, the, the name of the city really remained Constantinople until 1928. It wasn't until 1928 when the Ottoman Empire collapsed, all right, and uh, um the new government took over, Ataturk took over. And, uh, you know, there was a phrase at that time, back in those days, um, when the, the Constantinople was at its pinnacle. And every time you have a drink, you know, instead of saying salute or whatever, you would say Istanpoli, okay, in Greek, to the city. That was the, the big cry, to, and everybody would do, would. Uh, face the direction of the city and take their drinks and say, Istanbul. Well, it doesn't take much, much imagination to go from Istanbul to Istanbul, okay? And that's the, that's the name of, the, of, of uh, where they got the name from, or Istanbul, from uh, the, the cry of to the city, Istanbul. And I think that's, uh, that about does it for this uh, presentation. I get very emotional on it when I do this one. Um, there's a good shot of uh, Aya Sophia on the left and uh, no, I think I'm backwards. Yeah, and the blue mosque on the right. This is on the golden horn. But if you ever, if you want to, uh, on top of there, oh Christ God, preserve your city, undisturbed, free from war, conquer the fury of the enemies. That is uh, what was written on the walls of Constantinople, okay? So if you want to do any uh, personal research or just want to read further on it, there's a good website there for you, viasofia.com. And um, that's all I have to tell you about it. Um, I, I, uh, my intent here was to, to you know, you know th th this is part of us, this, 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 Constantinople, this whole thing was is part of us. And now there's less than 2,000 Greeks in the city. And uh, they would go through a, um, a period where uh, uh, the Armenians would be almost wiped out. It was, it was a horrible onslaught. This, this is in the 1920s I'm talking about. And a lot of the Greeks were, were removed and they had to leave. Uh, there are books on it. You may want to read on it. It's very interesting. Um, but... Um, the way we pay tribute, at least I do, is is to do this presentation and you know show everybody so that people don't forget about the Hagia Sophia and the sacrifices that our ancestors made for us and uh, to preserve orthodoxy. And that is why, if somebody's going to ask me the question, why doesn't why don't they move the patriarchate to someplace in Greece in Athens? Okay. Patriarch won't go. He, I heard him say it uh, when I was there. He said, he explained to us that uh, if he goes, he believes they, we'd lose everything else. We'd lose the, the patriarchate, the, the um, Church of St. George. Uh, they got the relics of the, uh, so many relics there, uh, so many um, 
artifacts from the the, the, the pole that Christ was was whipped on is there in, in the St. George Church. And uh, plus not only that, just the culture we would lose. All this stuff that I was talking to you about would be gone if we moved, if they moved out of Athens. So he refuses to leave the sacred city. And he, and he said that. He said that on TV when he was interviewed on um, 60 Minutes. He did an interview on 60 Minutes on August. If you get a chance to see it, it's uh, something interesting. Okay. Uh, did anybody have any questions? I went over a little bit, but this is my last one now until next April. Um, I may be able to do a Christmas thing. Uh, we're in our planning now. Oh, that reminds me. Anybody have any ideas of uh, what you'd like us to discuss or like me to discuss? Uh, you know, this is the time to let me know. Send me an email. Tell me what it is, and um, I'll be glad to do research on it. Dawn, are you still there? You're there, right, Dawn? You gave me a list. Uh, you wanted to see the apostles, a little more on the apostles, and we're doing that. As a matter of fact, uh, isn't that right? Then you asked for the apostles, the saints or something? Uh, saints and, of course, apostles are in. Yeah, and um, and a father's doing that right now with this uh, very good uh, blog on the apostles, Father Seraphim and the Father, Father Seraphim, did I say Father Seraphim? Mm -hmm. Father Nectarios and Father Andreas are doing it, and uh, you can catch up on that. Uh, while you're doing your exercises or whatever, cook a meal for your husbands or while your husband, if you're a husband, you're out mowing your grass, put your earphones on and listen to the pod. pod. It's very well done, very professional. I'm impressed with it every time I listen to it. Yeah. Okay, any questions, folks? No, not for me. I don't have any questions, but I don't know where I got this information, but being that uh, Jerry and I have a connection. Oh, I forgot something, Tess. Oh, okay, go on. Oh, no, this is different. This is different, but let me let me find it here. Uh oh. Uh oh, I made a whole thing on it for you. Oh, oh no. Yeah. Well, I can think I can remember it. Here it is. Do you have you ever heard of Caterina Gatelusco? Where is that? I don't see it. It's right up top here. First line in red. Oh, yeah, you can see this. Can't you see the slide that I have up here? Oh, no, Which I got to go. It says Caterina Gatilusco. Yes, wife to okay. Constantine. Yeah, they were married in Mitilini. Oh. And died at the um, Paleo, Paleo Castro. Castro, the old, is that I old know, castle? Yeah. In Limnos. Oh, boy. 1442, she's buried there. Well, you know, Paleologos, the, the uh, surname Paleologos yeah. is very renowned in Limnos. It's a very... Yeah. They, yeah. they deserve it. He deserves yeah, that. A right. lot of uh, people with the last name Paleologos. Poor Constantine. His, he finally found a woman that he liked. <laughs> and he married her and she died in pregnancy, uh, having a child there. Well, anyway, my, my, I don't know where I got this from. I have to, I should uh, go and make, verify before I say anything. But my parents always told me that the last island that was liberated from the Ottoman Empire, from the Turks, was Limnos in October 1912. So you can Google that and see if my well, yeah, but well, I'm a, I'm surprised, and what I was reading, how much happened in Limnos? Yes, the uh, the <laughs> Constantinople. Yes, I guess this is why I like it so much. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, well, Limnos is right there at the Black Sea. Yeah, it's yeah. right at the tip. Yeah, I have a third Turkish in me. I took one of those uh those, oh, no. those things. Um, yeah. What do you call it? You know, those uh, ancestry.com yeah, things? Yeah. Yeah. I have a third third of me is Turkish. Well, I don't know whether I'd want to be proud of that. <laughs> oh, should we? Huh? Well, I didn't. Yeah, I mean, 70% of me is not. <laughs> oh, okay. Because Gus used to say we used because he was from Mavia. Anyway, we don't, I'll tell you another time. But it's that close. I mean, uh, you know. Yeah. Yeah, so um, and Mitilini is close to Limnos. It's not far. That's yeah. where my mother's side. It's our capital. From. It's our uh, county. It's where we mm -hmm. go for all government papers and county seat. Mitilini. Okay. 
Any questions, anybody? I got a lot of people on here. Um, because if you don't have any questions, I'm gonna go get my coffee and uh, my cookies. <laughs> you Thanks. deserve it. That was good. Enjoyed that. Appreciate all your work and research. Who's saying that? Dawn. Is that Dawn? Thank you, Dawn. I have one question or one, I guess. Did Mehmed believe he was a continuation of the Roman Empire that was started by Constantine the Great? Did he? He, really? <laughs> he, he uh, made sure that everybody understood that he was carrying that legacy. Yes. Okay. Now, he didn't think that it was his right to go and, and claim it or anything like that. But I mean, when he finally got it, he said, hey, that makes me the head of all this stuff now. OK. And he did um, you know, use that title. He had so many titles. Uh, he, uh, that he's buried in a church that I've been trying to find every time I go there. And I, I finally found it. Um, it's called the Church of the Holy Apostles. And it's right in that area, right near the Vlacherna area, it's close to that one. Um, and Mehmet is buried there. You waving to me? Okay, I'll wait back. Is that about Mehmet, <laughs> are you leaving? <laughs> Mehmet is buried there. Um, and that, see, that was church was built by Constantine the, the Great, the first Constantine, the Holy Apostles. And he had put, he'd gotten the remains of all the saints and he put them there, all the original apostles, and they were all buried there. That's why they called the church the Holy Apostles. All right. Well, it's now a mosque and uh, Mehmet is actually uh, buried there. And he's now known as Mehmet the Conqueror. He also picked up the name uh, Mehmet the Faith, F-A-I-T-H. And the area, that area where the Holy Apostles is known as the area of faith. Uh, but he he felt that he was now the the um, you know continue with the legacy of the Roman Empire. That's why he wanted he started conquer uh, tried to conquer Venice because he was going after Rome too. He's going to conquer Venice and then go to Rome, and um, he died. Hmm. He got very sick as he as he got older. He got to, he was very dumpy. Um, he was slouched over and he was always diseased with something, and he died eventually. Hmm. 